Uh, hi, welcome. Thank you guys for coming. I'm Liz Hoffman. I'm the business and finance editor at Semaphore. Um, here with Courtney Powell, who's the managing partner at 500 Global, invest, venture investor, heavy in the Middle East, and Ray McGuire, who is the president of Lazard. I'm going to talk about the investment landscape, money in and out of the region, where it's going from here. To start high level, Middle Eastern money is everywhere. It's in Hollywood, it's in sports, it's on Wall Street, broadly speaking, trying to diversify their economy away from energy. I'm going to ask you, Ray, high level, how is it going? Is there a time in the future that you can see when these economies are not heavily dependent on oil? Where the companies are not heavily or heavily? Yeah, where, the, where these countries have diversified themselves significantly away from energy. Well, first of all, let's, first of all thank you for having me. I see all this, these beautiful people here, beautiful, like really smart people. So I am honored to be here. Um, I think it's important to put this in context, right? You have a MENA region that is probably somewhere between Germany and India when it comes to size of economy, four trillion plus dollars in economy. If you then look at the assets under management, you're close to four trillion dollars across the region, assets under management. And you have probably two trillion plus dollars of investable assets with the sovereign wealth funds, which put it at amongst the highest, if not the highest, highest individual being uh, up north in Norway, uh, and then a little east, a little, little further east. But if you put this in context, that gives you some sense of the purchasing power, the global purchasing power. And the way that we look at this is that there's a core investment in region where a lot of the capital is going, but there is a significant amount of capital that is going out of region as they stabilize what's taking place in region. In the outer region, you see a lot of capital being deployed. I think it's probably slower in its deployment given what's taking place in the overall asset management space over the past two to three years, especially given the slowness in growth. Uh, when we had at the end of 21, you had many of the largest asset managers putting $150 billion or so of, of raise um, under management or into the capital stack across the platforms of private equity and private credit, which is growing. Uh, but we see that region becoming increasingly important as it deploys capital. It will be important in major geographies around the world. So within region, yes, but outside of the region, in the growth GDP economies, in the West especially. What does it take? What is the sort of timeline to have countries and economies who's, that don't fundamentally grow and shrink with the price of oil? Well, it's going to take a while to transition, right? If you look at the, what I will identify as probably the five macro trends that exist across the globe, and there's some clearly micro trends that are local and will have impact globally, but I would say generative AI is one, energy transition the other, deglobalization or reindustrialization would be another, aging, not only the largest growth area in this country of 65 years and, and older, but if you look, at, you look at what's taking place in Amina, and if you go for the South, Largest growing demographics are going to be those people who are pretty young. And then clearly, because all of us live on, on these machines, and it's going to cross the region more rapidly, cybersecurity is going to be critical. So how we deploy capital in the context of those macro dynamics is going to be, it's going to be strategic. It's probably going to be a little slower given global GDP growth. And, uh, but it will have an impact because the capital that is controlled in the region is so massive. Courtney, you do a lot of venture investing in the region. What's, what takes the place? Like, what, what is the industry that's coming up that, that really feels vibrant and sort of self-sustaining uh, in the next, call it, five or 10 years? Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible time, certainly, to be investing um, across many emerging markets, but the Middle East in particular. And a lot of that is because you have such an incredibly young uh, population. If we look at Egypt, if we look at Saudi Arabia, if we even look at Pakistan, you're looking at 70% of the, con of the country underneath uh, age 35. And you have the highest mobile penetration, the highest Wi-Fi penetration in many of the countries within the Middle East. And you have the awareness of uh, startups and of technology being a true driver. So today, when we're investing in these markets, we're seeing just exactly what you would see in more advanced economies like the US. 
um, a lot of consumer uh, startups coming online. Um, education continues to be a really critical driver around these regions that have massive populations that are underserved um, in some cases from an education perspective. Um, and then you have health tech and infrastructure as well um, that are gonna continue to be um, really massive drivers. And finally, I would say perhaps most significantly, you have FinTech and financial inclusion in particular. If you take Egypt, for example, you have a population that is uh, largely unbanked in many cases, and you need to see these populations uh, brought online and um, you know, using uh, more uh, modern FinTech technology. So we're seeing a lot of really interesting growth across FinTech as well. Buzzword everywhere in startups is the everything app. Um, and they tend to be pretty localized, pretty regional, right? India has one, Singapore has one, China has one. I think Elon Musk would like to make X, the one in the West. Um, but they tend to do best in developing economies where, to your point, very young population, pretty unbanked, not a lot of bad analog habits that you have to break. Is there a contender there? Is that a, is that a ripe spot for, for someone to kind of combine and for these people who don't know, you can explain what an everything app is, but what happens there? Sure, for an everything app or a super app, I think the best example of that is probably WeChat in China, where you're using it, of course, for you know, your chatting purposes, but it's also just a full uh, stack commerce platform as well. I actually tend to think that um, kind of the super app will be most likely to see large-scale success in Africa, where you have a population that is so, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, so dependent on mobile uh, for every aspect of their lives. I think in the Middle East, where you, um, and especially within the GCC, where you tend to have um, you know, higher uh, disposable income, I think people are actually going to be a little bit less dependent on kind of the super app philosophy. But certainly across Africa, I think it's, uh, it's a real opportunity. Talked about inclusion, um, big challenge in the region. Some, you know, gender dynamics, huge immigrant populations. Is that uh, are those problems that are better addressed by startups than perhaps by incumbents, or is there going to be some built-in resistance to? That. You know, for uh, I can speak to our own portfolio. So we've made um, almost 400 investments across the Middle East uh, since 2012. And about 30% of our venture portfolio is uh, female founded or co-founded, which is higher than actually um, many in the U.S. Uh, in terms of their portfolios. So we've not faced an issue or a pipeline issue with regard to being able to invest in diverse founders and female founders. And you're actually starting to see the venture community as well across the Middle East um, uh, start to bring on more female GPs, um, and we hope that that trend continues. So for us, um, it's not been uh, problematic, but I think it certainly has taken a real lens to think about how you know you do become inclusive in your investment practices. I'm going to ask one more question on money coming in, and then we'll we'll shift to money going out. Um, the best startup economies tend to have pretty robust capital markets. Uh, can you explain kind of a little bit the you know if you're a startup in the region, you want to go public. What are your options, and and is there really the capital there to help you grow? There's certainly the capital there to, to help you grow and you know, just, again, kind of using our own experience. We started our first fund in the region in 2017. We made 180 investments out of that fund. Today, there's almost 17 of those companies that are worth over $100 million, and six that we think have real um, near-term potential for a liquidity or an exit event. And today, your options are either to come to the US, of course. You can look at the Abu Dhabi market. Uh, Saudi Arabia is doing a lot of really significant regulatory changes with regard to their, uh, uh, the Tata Wool as well. And so we see a lot of you know, potential uh, from the exit market. But I think for the near term in the Middle East, uh, M&A is going to continue to play a really large role. And you're also going to see startups continuing to um, you know, exit uh, elsewhere, too. Mene, we're back in back in race right One more question there, though: Is it important to you that that local startups go public locally, or is it more of a, a sign of uh, a good sign if they can if they can get listed in the U.S. For, yeah. Well, listen. I think the 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 objective is to attract the most significant long-term investors, and those investors therefore give confidence to other investors in the marketplace that the idea. Is a, is a credible idea. So access to the largest markets, I would think, would be the preferable route. But if you can list simultaneously, that also gives you an advantage to access a local investor so that they can also participate in a lot of the upside and, and, and help the entities grow. So it's both. It's not either or, it's both. But if you're thinking about listing and you have a platform or an entity that is attractive enough to investors who have large capital bases to invest, then obviously you'd like to go there. 
but that doesn't dismiss you going to um, other exchanges, other local exchanges. The largest, I guess, would be in Saudi. Saudi, yeah. Um, you mentioned, what, $2 trillion of investable assets in the region. That's almost certainly going to go up if we get $100 oil. Um, when you think about, uh, I'm asking you a question I know you're not going to answer, which is that it was pretty well reported over the summer that Lazard had been in talks with, um, with Abu Dhabi uh, about a potential sale or a stake. So just keeping that in mind, like when you talk to clients about, um, you give them advice about, a, in, at, about accepting money from the region. How do you think about it? What are the pros? What are the cons? Does it make a difference if it's coming from Saudi Arabia, from the Emiratis, from the Qataris, from Kuwait? Is there, help us think through that process when, when you have a Western client that's thinking about these big pools of money. You know, when, when, when you think about the asset managers, the regional asset managers, there are several that exist by country. And so you can't just think of it monolithically because each of these are different. They have different theses of investment. They have a different profile. They have different talents. So if you think about who's going to invest where, the dollars are attractive dollars. They are sophisticated dollars because they come from a certain region that has significant assets to divest or invest. The Western investors are looking at that as well. If you, if you think about the largest asset managers here and look at their inventory of who they're limited partners are, you will find a lineup of each of the largest of the MENA asset managers. So they go through and they will conduct diligence the same way that the Norwegians will conduct diligence or the Chinese will conduct diligence or the Canadians will conduct diligence or the large state-owned pension funds in the U.S. will conduct diligence or Tomasic or GIC. Same process, same level of diligence, same level of rigor they're looking for the same kind of return. And so think about the shareholders in region are looking for attractive money on invested capital, attractive net IRRs, and the people who are the recipients, the general partners are looking for the capital they can invest so they can generate a return. Are they agnostic? No, I think they're pretty sophisticated and pretty clear about with whom they want to do business. But there are choices that exist out of the region and the general partners are choosing amongst those choices and the limited partners in the region are choosing amongst the general partners. I mean, I think, you know, three, four years ago, you had a client who says, thinking about taking a large check from the Middle East. Would that be a different discussion than it is today? I remember, you know, whatever year that was, I can't quite remember the, you know, FII, like people pulled out and this year, I think it's in a couple of weeks and it's a very full slate from the West. So it sort of feels like, uh, like the approach to the region has changed. And I'm curious whether you think that that makes it easier for, for Middle Eastern money to, to land in serious places in the West? Again, I would be sensitive to it being monolithic. Okay. We actually have to go by country. And you have to look at the circumstances within a country to give you a sense of what the reaction is going to be to that country as an investor. And over time, uh, you'll have a country that has a certain profile and people will either be attracted to it or they will decide that they don't want to engage. But that has happened. We've seen that over the past 20 years. If I think about the dynamics of investors from the region, I say that dynamic has transitioned over 20 years, and we've had a significant transition over the past five years. OK. Um, a lot of these big sovereigns have essentially dual mandates. They have to get good investment returns, but they also try to ensure that, that there's some tangible benefits that come back mm -hmm. to their home countries. I'm curious, I guess I'll ask you both, Courtney, first, like how successfully you think they do that, how committed they are to the latter. I was just reading the other day, I think it was Saudis bought a big stake in Lucid, the EV company, which is now building a plant, I mean, a very tangible investment in, in the country, sort of how they balance those two, those two jobs. Sure. So I'm, I think it's, it's really important to, to double down with um, you know, what was just said with regard to the sovereigns and the LPs coming out of the Middle East being extremely sophisticated and really having all of the leverage in the world right now to be able to choose the top managers. So um, I think that's a really important point to, to make. But with regard to the dual mandate that they have, I mean, if you look at Vision 2030 coming out of Saudi, Vision uh, as well as UAE, Vision 2040 now coming out of Oman, 
you see really um, a comprehensive programs that are meant not just to deploy capital, but also create really sustainable uh, practices within their home countries. So if we look at Saudi in particular, you've seen a lot of success in developing um, local managers and developing uh, startups locally, you know, really trying to create the education and the talent network to be able to see startups uh, where I focus in particular thrive. Um, so I think it's very real and I think you are seeing um, excellent results. Uh, we began investing in the Middle East in, in 2012, 2013, had our first office there in 2018. And the difference between working with the sovereigns and working with the governments and the local entrepreneurs from 2018 today uh, to today is, is night and day. Um, so certainly from my vantage point, uh, being on the ground, it's been an enormous success. And I think they also have the added benefit of having learned from other uh, economies that have already matured to be able to get there faster um, as a result. Ray, what do you think? Are these are they, are they leading with their their sort of economic nationalism that they have some job to do for for their home country? Or are they more or less like any other sophisticated investor you'd run into? Well, I'm not quite certain that you can marry those two. One is a sophisticated investor assumes that investing in country is not a sophisticated investment. I don't think that was the intent, but that may be an interpretation. Local, let's make certain that we have local infrastructure in place. Let's make certain that we have the best talent in place, the best trained talent that can compete with the most sophisticated investors around the world. We have to get local right first, which is the vision that, that Courtney referenced. In each of the large geographies, they have a vision about how they want to participate and contribute over the next 10 to 15 years, if not longer. And many of those visions include, by definition, making certain that the local infrastructure is in place. And if you visit many of the countries in the region, that's exactly what they're doing. Now, some 10 to 15 years ago had huge light skyscrapers that were built way, and we all went to see, and they were like going to Bilbao and seeing one of the great architects' signature event. We had some of that. I think that has probably slowed. So you got more focus on making certain that the capital infrastructure in place, that the physical infrastructure is in place. So yeah, there's local, but that's local sophisticated investment. I don't mean to just pouring money out without some sense of return or some sense of impact. Well, well that's the other thing I wanted to ask because I think there's um, they have some incentive to do slightly uneconomic things in an effort to, I don't know, influence to have some cultural influence. Mm -hmm. like it may be that the PGA turns out to be a good investment for, for the Saudis, however that turns out, I don't know. But I don't think that's why they did it, right? I mean, sports and media are such, um, they're, they're hugely powerful influences around the world. And because I'm just curious, like how you think uh, they, uh, you know what? I students. love the uneconomic, at least monetarily uneconomic, the way you're defining it, investments. I'm going to walk down the street here and see Metropolitan Museum. I'm going to walk around the corner and see Museum of Modern Art. I'm going to go see Central Park. I can't tell you whether or not those returns have ever been generated, but today they're infinitesimal. I mean, you can't, they're, you can't calculate. They're incalculable, the returns that they have on the people, the visitors, I'm presuming that some of the plays in Broadway are generating some pretty attractive returns. When I go to a museum, again, uneconomic, but I love going to museums. I love taking my 10-year-old to see the dinosaurs. Anybody in here, look at the lines around the Museum of Natural History. They are packed with kids who love that. I can't tell you what the return is, and I sit on the board. I'd love the philanthropic dollars to come in so that we can build these institutions so that we get not only economic income, but we get emotional psychic income. Yeah. which is equally as important as we grow societies, as we become more inclusive. So look at the cultural landscape, look at the educational landscape, look at the ability to invest so that the people's lives are better. The disparity that exists in region between the wealthiest and the poorest is pretty dramatic. So see if we can invest to bridge that delta. Mm -hmm. And that, if that, is, if, that is, if that is observed as an uneconomic investment, I'll take it every day. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I also think it really matters the, uh, the time frame that you're talking about. You know, perhaps uneconomic uh, in the short term, but these sovereigns have extremely long-term views, and they're willing to put in the investments today for their culture, so, you know, to see a return for the economy, for the youth population to remain excited and engaged and 
um, you know, proud to be coming from an ascending economy like many of them are. So I think that the time horizon is something that differs uh, today. So I'm gonna left, I've kind of one last question, which is, you know, let's go 10 or 15 years in the, in, down the road. Do the, do the sovereigns that really now like, you know, really control these economies and are huge players in it, does it look more like, you mentioned GIC and Tomasic in Singapore, very professional investors, certainly have public money, but you know, are kind of doing their own thing. Or is it important for you know, the companies that they back to, to become, to have a corporate sector that is kind of underpinned by these firms, but that like you don't lead with, with PIF, you don't lead with ABQ, you lead with the companies that they've, that they've backed and founded. I'm gonna start with you, Ray. It's important to have both the Saudi Aramco, the Savics of the world, uh, the, the, apart from the energy producers, those companies that, in which she's investing that will grow, that will be signature in that they have derived from the region, but will also be signature because on the global corporate landscape, they have a place in that they have earned that place through the growth and through the performance of that management team and those boards. So we need both. We need to have signatures that come out. I can think about what used to take place in Hong Kong with some of the major companies that are global in Hong Kong that we all knew. And you're gonna find that in other regions as well. But this region has the ability, region that I'm thinking monolithically across MENA, has the ability to create well-identified, well-respected, well-capitalized, highest performing entities that just happen to be from the region, but compete globally. Last yeah. word for you. I, I mean, I think people forget that Silicon Valley had 50 years of government intervention and government money being deployed directly into the university system and uh, you know, Stanford and MIT and all around the world before it was its own sustainable ecosystem. So from my vantage point at early stage uh, investing, you know, the amount of dollars that are being uh, poured into the ecosystem today to develop these companies or um, either their ecosystems as a whole is, it's required, right? It's necessary, but it doesn't mean that it won't be sustainable in and of itself very soon, just as we were able to accomplish in the U.S. All right, we'll wrap it up. We're out of time. Thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone, for Thank coming. Thank you. Thank you.